on behalf of the Niagara Association of Realtors, the Greater Fort Erie Chamber, and the Niagara Falls Chamber of Commerce, we welcome you to what we hope to be an informative hour. I'm your moderator, Kevin Jacoby, and our members have experienced a number of challenges over these past two years. And what we're hoping to do today is learn where the candidates' perspectives are on some of these issues. We've identified five questions that we have asked each candidate to address. Each candidate to respond to each question. They will each be provided with a three second warning. And when their three minutes are up, their microphone will be muted. So joining us this afternoon are Wayne Gates from the NDP, Ashley Waters from the Liberals, um, Bob Gale from the PC and Tommy Ward from the Green Party uh, were invited, but they sent their regrets. So luckily that gives more time for Ashley and Wayne to let us know where they stand, uh, both for their parties and where, where they are in our community. After all, we're business people. We can consider this a job interview. And from my experience, I only got jobs when I showed up for the interview. So best of luck to both of you on the upcoming election. So we flipped a coin prior to uh, prior to starting this conversation and actually won the coin toss. So what we'll do is actually we'll start on the first question. Wayne will then give his comments on that question. And then we'll reverse the order for the second going back and forth. So Ashley, uh, thank you for being here. Our thank first you for question, having me. You're quite welcome. Our first question is, how does your housing strategy ensure that affordable housing is available to support the various levels of jobs created by employment in our different commercial zones in the area? Well, as we know, affordability is a major concern and knocking on doors and speaking to the community members, that is something that many people are really worried about where their children are going to live, where their grandchildren are gonna live, and even themselves because there has been so much inflation that's happened. So our, Ontario, our Ontario Liberal platform has rent controls that we've um, spoken about in, in as far as blind bidding, trying to get rid of blind bidding. So that way there's not some exorbitant costs that um, people are overpaying for housing. And also as far as um, you talked about commercial wise, commercial zones, um, having access to transit. Um, so that way it makes it easier for people to come and have have good quality jobs here, um, uh, being close to community centers, focusing on working with municipalities in order to have regional housing. Uh, we're going to invest 300 million over five years to accelerate housing approvals and getting rid of uh, backlog of approvals. And so that way there's social and community uh, supportive housing that's available, which is really important for safety nets within the community and uh, having a housing first approach. So that way we're not letting anyone on the streets and making sure that we're dealing with the emergency centers and, and shelters and being supportive that way. And so over the next uh, 10 years, there will be a hundred um, million dollar investment for, um, there will be a hundred million new homes built over the next 10 years, creating 150,000 new jobs throughout uh, building those homes and having taxes um, that are currently sitting empty, uh, especially for non-Canadian owners. So that way we have a ban on uh, new non-resident ownership. And so to introduce um, almost a use it or lose it um, incentive where if there's a, a lot that's sitting empty that it can be only for a certain amount of time uh, rather than waiting for more inflation to take place. So that way they, uh, you know, builders can't necessarily raise up the costs uh, waiting on those that vacant land. Uh, that's something else that we were looking at and ensuring um, that we're utilizing um, certain areas that are brownfield buildings and trying to use those spaces in order to redevelop or, or having housing options for, for everyone within our community. Great, thank you, Ashley. Wayne, can I have your comments on this question, please? Yeah, I, first of all, I appreciate the, the question, but I also uh, wanna make sure that I mentioned the fact that uh, as the MPP for the last uh, nine years, I don't just represent Niagara Falls. I actually represent uh, Fort Niagara Falls, Fort Erie, and Niagara-on-the-Lake, uh, something that I take great pride in over, over the years. And uh, I want everybody to understand uh, that it's a pretty big riding and that uh, I represent all those communities. Um, we know the cost of housing has skyrocketed under the Ford government. We have a plan to fix it. Here are some of the key elements of that plan. First, we're going to update zoning rules to allow for construction of more affordable housing, like duplexes, triplexes, 
and townhouses. Second, we will build 250,000 affordable homes that are operated by public, nonprofit, and co-op agencies. Rent will be geared to income. Third, equally as important, we'll crack down on speculation by, speculation by introducing a 20% non-resident speculation tax and close loopholes that allow wealthy investors off the hook. This will prevent foreign corporations and billionaires, which I'm not one of, uh, from buying up real estate at the expense of regular families, uh, and which is equally important. And this is good for young people. Um, I have a daughter that's 24 years old uh, that's obviously uh, are, are looking to move into the housing market uh, as well. And I've talked to a lot of young people over the course of the last uh, last campaign, like this campaign, knocking on doors. And uh, so finally, our third thing, we're going to help first time home buyers by giving them 10% of the purchase price of their home as a loan down payment, uh, which should get uh, help young people. And there's a few things that we have to stop uh, that I believe are very, very important. Uh, the blind bidding. The blind bidding is absolutely awful for people, not just young people, but anybody that's looking to buy a home uh, where the, the house, I think, yes, I think this morning, Ashley, I said 399, I'll use 4, 499,000, seeing the average price in Niagara Falls is over $700,000 now from 330,000 uh, just four years ago. Um, but blind bidding, so you, you, the house is four ninety nine. You get seven or eight people come and bid on it, and you know. And now, next thing you know, that house is going for six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, one hundred fifty thousand dollars over over asking price. Uh, I think that should be uh, should be uh, stopped. I know the federal government is talking about it, but as as we speak right now, uh, nothing's being done there. Uh, that has to be stop stopped. And part of that is. Uh, um, they're not allowing if you say that you'd want to have a home inspection before you purchase a home. So you can see uh, everything that's around that home. Uh, um, if you put down a home inspection, you're not getting the house. Uh, I think that's wrong. I think uh, we should have home inspections all the time. Uh, I don't think it's fair. I think some of the people that purchase homes are really running into a lot of problems with the homes they purchase because they're so scared of not getting a home uh, and not they decided not to agree to a home inspection and now they're faced with thousands and thousands of dollars of repairs in that home they just bought. And usually when you buy the house, uh, you're really at your end, right? You know, you, you put all the money into the home to get a home and now you're, you're facing bills six months, eight months, a year later. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, so equally important, we're seeing a lot of rent evictions, quite frankly, in Niagara. Uh, where, uh, and a lot of times it's outside, outside individuals coming from uh, either other parts of the province or uh, other parts of the world. And they, uh, they're buying homes, they're buying duplexes, they're buying apartment buildings. And uh, uh, they're saying, well, we're going to fix them up. And they're called rent evictions. And, and what I found with our seniors, uh, some of these places, they've lived in them for 15, 18, 20 years, and they're paying $900, let's say, a month. And once they come in and throw a little paint on the walls, uh, then then it's going up to $1,700, $1,800, $1,900. And we know, uh, at least I know, I'm sure everybody uh, at the chamber knows, our seniors uh, can't afford their, their, their wages, their pensions are not going. All right. Um, this next one is very important to our business community. Uh, it's the idea of uh, our labor force. Uh, what is your party's plan to ensure we have a skilled labor force available to our businesses in the area? And I'll ask Wayne to start this question for us, please. Uh, thank you very much for the question. I, I really, uh, I really like to go uh, first on this question because uh, I'm not sure if uh, my uh, liberal uh, friend there is uh, knows this, but I'm actually the critic for skilled trades. Uh, so I've had a lot of discussions on uh, skilled trades issues, on new labor bills that were put forward uh, by the Conservative government, particularly around uh, Bill 88 and some of the issues that we face on health and safety with the skilled trades as well. But to answer your question directly, uh, which I know that's what you'd like me to do, uh, but uh, uh, I have had lots of debates at committees on uh, with uh, the other parties on what's best for our skilled trades, on uh, particularly around safety issues and particularly around Bill 88. And uh, so skilled trades are absolutely necessary for a strong economy. We need more high school trades and shop classes, and we need to do a better job of promoting the value of trades in our schools. We need to work with trades people 
employers, schools to create a new opportunity for education and in particular apprenticeships. And I'll give you an example on apprenticeships uh, because why it's so important to build a new Niagara Falls hospital. Uh, when they built the St. Catharines Hospital, uh, they used some uh, local tradespeople, uh, quite a few, particularly in the I IBEW. And they had over a hundred uh, apprentices uh, while they're building that hospital. So the hospital will give another opportunity for uh, skilled trade to work, uh, not just IBW, but trades for people to build that new hospital. And I think that's important. But we also need to create opportunity for people in skilled trades to make a good living right here in Niagara. And I might have got ahead of myself here, but that means ensuring that local trades are able to work on local projects and infrastructure. For example, building our new hospital with local workers. Uh, I've been saying that since, uh, well, I guess it's been a long time since we've been talking about the new hospital, but that's the one focus that I stayed on. Local workers, make sure local engineers, uh, local businesses, which uh, could supply some of, the, uh, some of the stuff that's needed to build that hospital. I think, I think it's an opportunity. And the reason why it's important for hiring local people, because local people spend in local community. If we bring tradespeople from Windsor or Toronto or outside the community, they're taking that money back to their community. They're not spending it on our restaurants and our, our, um, our hotels or whatever, or the show or all that kind of stuff that keeps the local economy running. I think that's very, very important. This creates job opportunities, allows skilled trades to remain in the region, which I'm talking about, and also means those workers spend dollars on their businesses right here in Niagara. And I'll ask the chamber, what do you think that is? I believe that's a win, win. Uh, that's what we're looking at, obviously, when we're, when we're talking about trades. Now, I want to talk about the schools a little bit, because I think that's an avenue that we're missing. There's a lot of things that can be done better around the trades. Um, but when I was in uh, school, I took trades uh, in grade seven and eight. I, uh, I remember doing woodwork. I built, I built a clock that actually lasted for 20 years. I was amazed at myself, quite frankly. But then I took a four-year tech course at the St. Catharines Collegiate which some of you may or may not know. And in there, I took welding, I took auto body, I took sheet metal, I, talk, I took auto mechanics. And what I did is I learned about the dangers about working around a machine. I learned about how to lock out a machine uh, to make sure that if I got a job uh, coming out and I'm a little older, so you could almost work anywhere you wanted when you uh, finished high school. Uh, so I thought it was important. I got into General Motors. I wasn't scared of the big machines. I wasn't scared to work in the machinery. I understood the, the power and the danger that you had there. But that was all because we had shop classes and I learned at an early age in grade seven and grade eight, we need to bring shop classes back to seven and eight. We need to put it back into our high school and then and then grow it into places like Niagara College, uh, where they do have an apprenticeship program there and, and talk about trades. But we do we need to expand it and we need to fund it. Uh, that's some of the issues. And we need to work with all the all the trades, whether it's a building trades, electrical, and talk to them and say, what do you need? And I know the number one issue with them is safety. I also know the opioid crisis uh, that's affecting all our communities, quite frankly, right around the province. Uh, the carpenters want to make sure that uh, there's a lot of talk around the opioid crisis because what happens is uh, skilled trades stay in the job even though they're injured because uh, they're scared to go on WSIB because they go on WSIB, they end up uh, being denied. They end up being deemed and some of them end up living in poverty. So the- Ashley. Can I ask your opinion on um, how to improve uh, the accessibility of skilled labor in our community? So during the process for our stakeholder calls with the party, I was lucky enough to be on the post-secondary skills and training squad. So I was able to speak to our colleges and universities and really understand the need um, for working with post-secondary um, education in order to have um, ready skilled trades here within Niagara. And so luckily we do have Niagara College and Brock University. And so micro-credentialing, making sure that people are able to go back to work, get quick access if they want re, um, re, reskilling, uh, upskilling uh, programs in order to have formal training apprenticeships. And so we are going to have $2,000 within grants for skilled trains, uh, internationally trained professionals, eliminating that Canadian experience required. So that way it's speeding up accreditation for people that um, normally would not be able to work and stay here within Ontario and more based on competency. So that way they are able to be within our labor market and we'd be doubling OSAP uh, assistance and freezing tuition and also doing $1 billion fund for new programs and increased operating grants to colleges 
universities and training skills and experiential learning here in Ontario, we lead the way. So that's really important. So that way students have placements and they're able to work and come out of school and already have a placement and a job. So that's something to focus on it as well. Eliminating interest on provincial student loans and bring back um, as far as adult learners and other training supports for OSAP and help colleges and universities create a safe and inclusive campus and support campus uh, mental health. That was something I heard on each one of our calls that was really a big issue was mental health and having supports and bringing back grade 13. That was a big part of it too, for any delays that kids have found for school to make them better prepared to enter into school. Um, so really just working with the local economy and the businesses to, to see where that gap is in order to attract people to come and learn and live and grow here within the Niagara community. Great. Thank you, Ashley. So our next question is about supply chain, which is really close to home to me. Uh, what the pandemic has really taught us uh, as business owners is that we have some vulnerabilities that we really need to address for the future uh, in order to make sure that we have consistent supply and ability to get our goods to market. So supply chains have been hampering our business competitiveness throughout this pandemic. What actions would you and your party take to ensure the resiliency? And I'll ask Ashley to start this one for us, please. Uh, Ashley's on mute at the moment. <laughs> so sorry. Uh, so as, as far as with business supports, we want to eliminate incorporation fees for new businesses, startups, and reduce regulatory burdens on small businesses. So by uh, capping, um, credit card fees charged to businesses, uh, cap the commission fees for businesses using outside delivery services. And we found that um, as far as within the pandemic, those supports weren't really given. Uh, a lot of the businesses, if we opened up too quickly and there wasn't PPE provided or there weren't rapid tests available within our communities, it really created um, extra waves that we found throughout our communities. So being cognizant of following um, you know, advice from our, our health experts in order for businesses to stay open and be operating and not necessarily just the bo big box stores, but our small businesses as well. And so having more of a robust domestic supply chain for uh, vaccines and making sure that um, that's available within our communities and creating uh, 25,000 new green jobs and establishing Ontario as a global leader for clean tech, clean energy manufacturing and electric vehicles for solutions and harnessing our hydrogen power as an econ economic driver and putting Ontario in control of its immigration, um, similar to what Quebec has in place. So that way we can bring internationally trained professionals with skills and needs here to Ontario and support newcomers who want to bring businesses and uh, business owners to expand Ontario's network of international trade offices and services, and to also help agri-food sector and uh, export more goods and track and publish uh, the metrics that impact people's lives like housing affordability and wage and growth. Um, so we've set some ambitious goals, but uh, they're in line with these metrics to uh, define our success within our cost it out platform. Great. Thank you, Ashley. Wayne, if we could ask you your opinion on how we can help ensure resiliency of uh, future supply chain. You absolutely can. The best way to address the supply chain issue is by expanding domestic capacity where possible by having an industrial strategy that promotes expanding domestic capacity that gives us a greater control of our flow of goods and services. I have said this for years, when it comes to the automotive industry, the coherent strategy can el eliminate some of the bottlenecks we see. This has added benefit for creating decent jobs in the province of Ontario. Supply chains are dependent on reliable workers and there's no better workers in the world than workers from Ontario and from Niagara. That's why the NDP supports increasing training, apprenticeship opportunities to match workers and employers. But we're willing to work with every level of government to give businesses what they need to move their products to market quicker. And I'll give a couple examples of what I'm talking about in that couple paragraph. Uh, we've been trying to get GoTrain here for uh, a number of years. Now we have it going one way, we need two-way all-day go train to Niagara. When somebody says, well, what's that got to do with competitiveness? That would get more cars off the road and it would allow uh, the bottlenecks on our highway where we're sitting there for hours 
uh, not being able to, uh, to move their products. Uh, a lot of the businesses are just in time, maybe not as many in Niagara, but certainly across the province of Ontario. And that was one way to do it. It would be able to get our food, our groceries, medical supplies uh, quicker. Uh, and it would protect the environment, something that I think uh, isn't being talked enough about, quite frankly, in this election. I know it's hard to do when you only have the same two people here all the time, uh, but at the end of the day, the environment is very, very important. And the environment is important for our supporting our wine industries, because uh, there is studies out there that will say that as the, as, as, as the temperature rises and we don't protect the environment, some of, some of those are uh, our farms and stuff are in jeopardy. And the, the other thing is we found out during COVID uh, how supporting local industries, when it came to, we had no PPE. Uh, we had to rely on China. We had to rely on other countries. Uh, if we were building uh, products right here in, uh, and I know we have some, some that can build uh, PPE right here in Niagara that aren't being used as, as supplies, uh, we should be using local, local way. So that's probably uh, my comments on that issue. So thank you very much. Oh, one other thing, electric vehicles. Electric vehicles is another way uh, to, uh, to help get uh, people uh, moving in the supply chain too. So. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. And it wouldn't hurt at the gas pump right now either. So definitely the great idea. Uh, we're going to kind of pee back on that last question that we just had and talk a little bit more about the idea of what we just went through as a community with the pandemic for the past two years. It really, really hurt our, our businesses. A lot of us were shot down or had limited capacity for us to keep moving forward. So what will you do to ensure we can stay open safely going forward? And does your party have a pandemic a preparedness plan in place uh, in case we have future waves happening. And I'm gonna ask Wayne to start this one off for us. Thank you very much. This is a great question and really highlights the need for advanced planning on the part of the government. Unfortunately, the Conservatives and the Liberal before them left Ontario with stock of PPE. Our hospitals and our long-term care homes were severely understaffed. We prepared, we weren't prepared at all for, for COVID. And it showed people died and small business and medium sized businesses suffered at a time when big box stores thrived. I think what small business were looking for during COVID was stability. Instead, Ford made decisions based on political timing rather than science. And he created an uneven playing field between big box stores and small businesses. Ford cho choices often didn't make any sense and they caused some small businesses to go under. Walmart was allowed to stay open because they had access to the premier's office, but local businesses couldn't. In places like Crystal Beach, Ridgeway, Stevensville, Queenston, Niagara-on-the-Lake, they all needlessly prolonged the lockdowns. We still need third round of funding, something we committed to. Businesses did their part, but they need to be made whole. And so far they haven't. In the event of any future public health emergencies, the NDP will be a stable, transparent and predictable partner to small business. And if needed, we'll provide timely support that, that's easy to access. And we found it hasn't been. It's been quite frankly a disaster. We won't give an unfair advantage to box stores and we will do everything in our power to keep you and your business working and open. Thank you. Ashley, can I get your comments on how you would help us if we do go through similar circumstances in the future? Well, optimistically, I think we're armed with the knowledge that we do have from the past two years. However, I have to say during COVID, that was one of the reasons why I decided to run. Um, my mom was going through um, breast cancer and I was her personal caregiver and we had to navigate the hospital system. And during that time, my children were on and off school and I was working full time. And I just thought if there was going to be a better way, then I had needed to be that change and put my name forward. And I feel like everything was reactive. There was not thoughtful planning from the Ford Conservatives. Um, there was a lot of opening, closing, um, shutting down playgrounds for police to have to check and card people in the area. Uh, there was a lot of decisions that didn't quite make sense. And so during that time, a lot of businesses, as we said, weren't prepared, didn't have the PPE, didn't have the PRC tests, uh, the PCR tests available. 
um, for myself in this last wave, I, I just lost my father four months ago. There was not uh, rapid tests available and that affects families. And we aren't statistics, we are real people and it affects our lives. And so by modeling that European um, factor, as far as they made it available for rapid testing, they have those supports. So they were able to open up a lot faster than some other countries and having those things available so people know to stay home if they're sick. Um, we want to give 10 paid sick days in order for people to stay safe and, and have the ability of not feeling like they're going to lose their jobs. Um, giving portable benefits to people so that way they're able to access uh, pharmaceuticals, the antiviral drugs um, that are necessary in order to keep everyone in our community safe. Um, so those are some of the things that we have costed out in our platform that um, everyone can see. You can go online and, and it lists everything that we, what I'm mentioning today. So just really making sure that we have those community sort of supports uh, for businesses and um, looking at how a lot of those health units, uh, public health units were merged together and everything kept changing. There was 34 different guides for each one of those branches. And I know for my scout, myself with Scouts Canada, I, I had to try to keep up with each one of the public health units to see what each was were saying. And so for businesses, they had to do much of the same to understand capacity limits and nothing was very clear. So making sure that um, the direction is clear, it's costed, there's a plan. That's what people are looking for leadership right now for our Ontarians. And, and that's what we're, we're hoping to give. Thanks, Ashley. And I'm sorry to hear about your father. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and our next question here is about healthcare, which seems uh, appropriate after your comments there. Uh, what will your party do to quality healthcare for every resident in Ontario? And Ashley, if you could start our conversation on this, please. So much to uh, what I was saying, we want to look at having uh, economic dignity, but also having portable health benefits for every Ontarian. So that way, it doesn't matter where you're working, that those benefits would follow you and having mental health supports. Again, I'm echoing my previous statement that that's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing from the stakeholders. I'm hearing from the community. Everyone has been affected. Uh, to make sure that people feel like there are those supports in place, removing the surgical backlogs, getting rid of Bill 124 that's capping the salaries of our frontline workers, and making sure that we have more access to train uh, people and uh, personal support workers, and getting rid of uh, for-profit homes for our seniors and making sure that they can age and live out their lives at their homes and giving supports that way. Um, those are things that we have as a part of our fully costed plan as well. And so we really want to make sure that everyone has access to healthcare. And as I said, navigating um, the, the system with my mother during that time uh, of needing surgeries, needing treatments, and not um, having a surgical backlog, that's again important. Like people are real people in your community and not having to leave to go to Hamilton for service and be able to stay here in Niagara and, and be treated at Walker. Those are the things that are important investing in our community in the South Niagara Hospital and having that come to fruition and shovels in the ground and making sure that our community has access. Um, knowing and hearing from the residents of Fort Erie when, um, you know, the emergency room was closed. Again, that affects communities. We had snowstorms during that, during that time. It, it wasn't available for families if they needed something to just be able to stay within their own community. Um, and, and that's real for people. So making sure that there's more supports for everyone. Thank you, Ashley. Wayne, could we get your opinions on how, what your, you and your party would do to help us get make sure there's quality health care for everyone in our area? Before I get into my statement, it's going to be staffing, staffing, staffing for health care workers and, and paramedics and doctors uh, and repeal Bill 124. Uh, that's, that's the nuts and bolts of it, but I do have other, other comments. If COVID had ta taught us anything, it's that our health care system needs fixing. I've been finding protect high quality public health care my entire adult life, working with community groups to keep services open and to expand coverage. People understand the value of investing in public health care, but the conservatives aren't listening. Ford failed to deliver on his promise to build a new hospital for Niagara Falls. 
It's time to elect a party that will finally get beyond the photo ops and empty promises and actually get shovels in the ground and begin construction. Ford also allowed the Del Douglas Memorial to be closed at the height of the pandemic when 34,000 people relied on that hospital in, in the Fort Erie and surrounding area. He diverted life-saving vaccines away from Niagara Falls and failed to protect seniors in long-term care where 4,700 died and over 500 right here in Niagara. Ford capped wages for healthcare workers and put a, but gave a bunch of conservative MPs a 14% raise. Ford has been a total disaster for healthcare in Niagara. Our frontline workers deserve better. Our seniors deserve better. The NDP has a plan to fix our broken healthcare system, a system that has suffered for years because of conservative and liberal neglect. It's time to make a different set of choices. To make, the NDP will make investments rather than cuts, including expanding dental care and mental health care, and will pay for it by asking big corporations and super wealthy to pay for it. And I think the biggest issue facing healthcare in, in, in Niagara and quite frankly, right across the province is this, the conservatives want to move into a privatization of our healthcare. We have to stop it. We have to collectively come together and stop it, whether that's business, whether it's your friends, your family, everybody. Uh, we do not want to get into a situation like they have in other countries. Uh, you should pay for your health care. It's a right uh, with, with your OAP card and not a credit card. So on June 2nd, use your vote to fix the health care crisis in Niagara. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here today. It's been a pleasure. And uh, anytime you invite me, I will, I'll definitely come and show up. And uh, if it's a debate or whether it's answering questions, I will always do that. Uh, I, and I thank the Liberal candidate for being here as well. Ashley, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Wayne. Actually, because there's only two of you decided that was important enough to address our business community, we do have time for one extra question. And this question is important to me because like many other people, I don't vote for a party. I vote for our leader in our community because regardless of who is the majority in, in parliament, our local leadership is important to us. You're here for us every day. So what I'd like to ask each of you is, please give me the most valid reason of why you should be our leader for this, these next four years. And I'm gonna start with, uh, with Wayne. Well, I said uh, nine years ago in a by-election uh, that, uh, uh, that I've got the opportunity and the privilege to represent uh, my communities of uh, Fort Erie, Niagara Lake, and Niagara Falls. I would be the hardest working MPP in, in Ontario. And I've tried to live up to that. Whether you lived in uh, Virgil, whether you lived in Niagara Lake, whether you lived in Stevensville or Fort Erie, uh, I have given every ounce of energy I can to serving uh, my communities. I love my community. I understand what we need, quite frankly, being I told the story this morning, I don't tell it very often, uh, somebody that uh, grew up in poverty and I've had the opportunity that uh, I have always got a hand up from some, somebody's always helped me along the way. I don't know what it was. I didn't have a mustache back then. So I don't think that was the reason why they decided to help me. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it taught me a lot that uh, every, everybody matters. Every person matters, doesn't matter uh, I guess the best way to say it without being too, uh, love is better than hate. And uh, I believe over the course of my uh, time as being MPP, I've given everything I can to the job. I'll continue to give everything I, I can to the job. I'll be a strong voice for, for Niagara. I have been a strong voice, whether it was healthcare, whether it's the GO train, whether it's trying to get MRIs, whether it's trying to get PSA uh, coverage. Uh, I've always stood up and fought, and sometimes it, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't always a popular thing, uh, but I always took the voice of the residents to Queen's Park, and I'll continue to be a strong voice. So, um, and I believe that uh, I've been a pretty good leader over the years, uh, not just as an MPP, as a city councillor, or as a, when I was a chair of the um, United Way for a few years, uh, president of my local union. Um, I consider myself a a leader, and you can only be a leader when you have support of the community. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. Ashley, uh, can you share with our, with our listeners and viewers here about why you would be the most effective leader then for the next four years for our community? Thank you, Kevin. 
So for myself to put myself forward was because of parity. I wanted to see parity at Queens Park. I didn't see myself represented there. And I wanted to make sure, and I'm proud to say I'm one of uh, the over 60% female candidates for the Ontario Liberal Party. And that in itself is historic. So to me, making sure that you have your voice lended to those conversations, those important ones. And I come from nonprofit sector and I believe in collaboration. I believe in bringing the right people to the table. I believe in dealing with the knowledge experts in each one of their fields, asking them, how do we improve upon something and then affecting that change? Not only one person, it will take everyone within our community to have a voice, to say what's needed in order to move forward and be prosperous, uh, prosperous here in Niagara. And so for myself, um, having the stakeholder calls, meeting with people, that's the most important work because then you're actually hearing directly from people that need something, that want something and want to see a change that affects them and their houses and this affordability and inflation. It's a crisis here in our community and people want help. They want to be able to work here and live here and, and stay. And my husband and I have been fortunate enough to been born and raised here in Niagara and have a home and have our children um, have good uh, education and quality supports. And we're able to volunteer within our community, which is so important to us and coach, you know, the soccer team for myself or the hockey team for my husband and those kinds of things. And being a community member and being active is really what's important to us. I, at a university, I was on um, uh, NAGA Research and Planning Council and that was a, a great experience for me because I was part of making those Livia and Niagara reports. And that was through the NAGA region in conjunction with, um, you know, Niagara Community Foundation, the YMCA in Niagara. So I learned a lot and I understand those different factors that we need in order to be prosperous here in, in our community. And I founded Next Niagara. I was one of the co-founders to make sure that we didn't have a brain drain that, you know, people like me at a university didn't have to move away in order to have a life and a family. I could stay in Niagara. And that's important to me. So my idea and vision for Niagara has always been steadfast. That's always collaboration, inclusivity, making sure that we're speaking to the right people, having mentors for anyone that wants to come up within our community and have that space and opportunity. So thank you very much. I'm getting the 30 second countdown. So I want to, I want to say thank you for having us. And I, and I do feel it's so important that Wayne and I are here. We're, we're here to take questions. We're here to speak about our platform. We're here to speak to the community because it's important for everyone to make an informed decision. So if we're able to speak and, and answer the platform, that should be for everyone as well. So all of our platforms are online. Please go and look, take that opportunity. Early voting starts tomorrow. Just make an informed decision because it does affect your life and your community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you both, uh, Ashley and Wayne. So on behalf of the Niagara Association of Realtors, Greater Fort Erie and Niagara Falls Chambers of Commerce, I'd like to thank you both again for taking part in this forum. And for everyone listening, we just want to remind everyone to get out and vote on June 2nd. Thank you all very much. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.